Central banks throughout the world have been printing money. This policy, known as quantitative easing in banker jargon, has pushed up the price of stocks and bonds. But will it lead to real and sustainable increases in global growth, or is it just sowing the seeds of future inflation? Welcome to the Atlantis Report. Can countries really print all the money they want? Paying for expenses by printing money is the magic recipe for many politicians. Although many say it works, the outcome is a foregone conclusion in the long run. It was 1914, and Ulrich Buscher, after a long career as a successful writer and editor, was ready to retire. He also thought he had enough savings to sustain himself. Unfortunately, Ulrich was in the wrong place at the wrong time to be able to rely on retirement. In fact, he lived in Germany. Germany, in those years, paid for its enormous military expenses for the First World War 1914 -1918, almost entirely in debt. The total debt was around $45 billion, equivalent to over $1 billion today. But, according to Emperor William II, the conquest of vast areas of resource-rich territories in France and Belgium would have largely offset all the debts. As we know, however, things did not go according to Germany's plans. When the country capitulated in 1918, Ulrich Buscher's pension was worth far less than it had only been four years earlier. During that time, the German mark lost 50% of its value, going from 4.2 to 7.9 marks for a dollar. But that was only the beginning. At the end of 1919, the dollar exchange rate dropped to 48 to 1. By the first half of 1921, it was 90 to 1 and, in late 1922, plummeted to 7,400 to 1. Germany was experiencing hyperinflation. In early 1922, Ulrich was able to buy a loaf of bread for 160 marks. But at the end of 1923, that same loaf cost 200 billion German marks. Meanwhile, the dollar exchange rate had plummeted to 4 trillion 210 billion to 1. In those days, many German economists insisted that the problem was not inflation but a shortage of circulating money. And, to cope with this shortcoming, the state presses worked continuously, to produce more banknotes. For Ulrich Buscher and his retirement, German hyperinflation did not bode well. Withdrawing all his savings from the bank, 100,000 marks, he bought the most expensive item he could afford, a subway ticket. Modern economists attribute the cause of German hyperinflation to the country's efforts to pay off its war debt, in addition to the enormous compensation owed to the war winners. Germany, however, abandoned the gold standard in 1914, and the money that the German Ministry of Finance had ordered to print was not supported by anything. To pay off the war debt, Germany simply printed multiple marks and converted them into foreign currency. A practice that has inflamed inflation. In large part, due to the catastrophic effects of hyperinflation, Germany took the road of political polarization, and, a decade later, a certain Adolf Hitler took power. We all know what happened next. A temptation still in vogue today, printing money to pay for expenses. There are more and more politicians who would like to finance the new expenses by making the state print the money. In other words, by borrowing anything you want, without worrying about deficit or inflation. By simply printing money, the state can pay its financial obligations. After all, since the world dropped the gold standard in 1971, the state can literally create as much money as it wants, out of nothing. And the state that issues its currency can always pay for its expenses with the money it creates. So, it is absolutely true that the state can print all the money it wants and, if there are no investors willing to buy the state debt, it will be the state itself, through the central bank, to buy it. In short, all is well in the short term, especially in a deflationary scenario, such as the one the global economy is currently experiencing. But what happens in the long term when inflation starts to rebound? In which case, all that remains is to remind us of Ulrich Buscher. The common understanding of inflation today relates to wage, price, and asset value increases that are disproportionate to economic activity increase. The classical way of measuring the growth of the currency money supply in circulation has proved unwieldy due to the high transfer rate. We now come to the fundamental problem with suppressed interest rates easy lending. Assuming that you are not a high-power financier, those with such financial skills will benefit more greatly than yourself. In a matter of speaking, they are the first pup at the teat. You being more average, will have to wait your turn. When you have finally started to suck wage increase, the mother starts to run out of milk.
The most obvious signs that are also easily measured are wage, cost and prices. It is then that lending availability liquidity is contracted. This is done so that the debt instruments bonds will not lose value. You may say, who cares if the banks get stiffed, well, you should care as an investor and taxpayer. When a financial institution's assets begin to lose value, they appeal to the central banks around the world for relief. The typical response is akin to financial austerity. The squeezing leads to a phenomenon known as an inverted yield curve. This is when short-term lending rates fall below long-term rates. Short-term rates are usually lower because of a shorter, more predictable risk horizon. Long-term rates are higher because of the potential for geopolitical eruptions, inflation, insolvencies, bond defaults, and government policy change. The crisis is caused by the banks and benefits the banks. Everyone else just pays the debt. Central banks inherently imply debt and not prosperity. The assumed prosperity in the world is built upon the assumption and law that the Federal Reserve notes are worth something. They are not worth the paper they are printed on, they are not backed by any gold. The US dollar is pure fiat money. The only reason the world holds it in high value is that it is the only form of currency the Fed will accept in payment of the debt, which is supported by law. The US dollar's value is based upon laws that forbid someone for not accepting it as currency. Now looking at the charts, we can see that, while M2 money stock doubled up $8 trillion since the financial crisis, M2 money velocity, the rate at which people spend money decreased by 30%. It appears that newly minted money QE and stimulus don't really make its way into the economy and spending. As the Fed keeps on printing more and more and more, the balance sheet is increasing like straight up, V-shaped, since mid-September early October. And yet they are pumping it into a dead system because all they can do is give it to the billionaire bankers who cannot even spend the money they already have. So it just sits there, it hoards, it doesn't move, it doesn't circulate. We have zombie companies in a zombie economy. When this cash gets created, it ends up behind the banking dam to receive interest payment from the Federal Reserve because loaning it out is riskier than holding it. This is the entire reason currency velocity is dead. Banksters are greedy, not stupid. Thus the entire reason why it was always a crap idea putting a bank in control of the currency. All banks, not just central banks, can create money, it's called fractional reserve banking. The central banks may print and mint, but all private banks lend out more than they have in deposits. The public has been duped into bailing out these private banking institutions. Their shareholders and insurance companies should have been forced by legal prosecution to have to cough up. But instead, the government bailed out the private banking sector at taxpayers' expense, to avoid a depression brought on by private banks withholding money to compensate for their losses. I think QE would have had a greater impact if that money was funneled towards the middle, lower class. They are the ones with the buying power and the habit of consuming with their disposable income. The bottom line is the middle, lower class needs more money. Whether in a reactionary way with QE or proactive with proper wages. Those economic classes are the engine if you don't take care of it, the other strategies you implement is going to fail. The central banks are not an arm of our government, they are privately owned by an alien race of greed-oriented, power-hungry psychopaths, and other privately owned large banks, all under the umbrella of a corporate structure. It's all a big scam. Central banks and Federal Reserve notes and fractional reserve lending are all corrupt practices. We are selling the future of our children by letting the Fed print money. Eventually, we will be paying 40% income taxes with no return. That will be catastrophic. The only way to balance the liabilities is to raise income taxes. These crooks know what they are doing. That's why the federal income tax bill was signed only weeks after the Federal Reserve Act on December 24, 1913. It was not a coincidence. It was planned. We need to end the Fed. We can print our own money and use fractional reserve banking to our advantage. We need a standard again with fractional reserve banking that has caps to the amount of money that can be printed. Like after 1933, when we ended gold swaps. But the dollar still had intrinsic value because it was still backed by gold. But fractional reserve does allow for unsubstantial growth, which is what you saw in the 40s and 50s. We had very little inflation until after 71 when we ended the gold standard. Our deficit was minimal too. But after 71, inflation took off, and the dollar lost value. 
and the deficit was taking off. So it is apparent what the end result is hyperinflation and devalues of the dollar by allowing the Fed to print money. In the end, all we get is massive debt, and debt means our slavery. The central banks cannot prevent an economic collapse. They can only push it off to a later date so that it doesn't blow up in their face. But by doing so, they only ensure the crash will be even larger. The Fed is a Ponzi scheme. Every dollar of new credit inflation is the principle of the new debt. The ostensible promise is to pay the principal plus interest at a future time. The interest is never created, it does not exist. The obligation is impossible to culminate. Such an act is an act of fraud that voids the contract. This understanding does not apply to commercial loans made by local banks. But this sequence ignores the transfer of a treasury security collateral to the FRBNY, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the value of the book entry credit made by the FRBNY on a government account. That security, as owned by the Fed, is sold at auction as a new cash fraction of rollover securities. The value profit is surreptitiously transferred to the owners of the theorized private owners of the BOG without any legal consideration from the BOG. This trillion dollars annually profit legally belongs to the government by charter stipulation. How many average Americans have the slightest clue of the truth of this? I'd say less than 10%. We need to end the debt-based money system. Fractional reserve lending is fraud supported by the government. 97% of the money supply in the US is created as debt with interest owed on it. The money supply is the one thing in society that must be nationalized. All Ponzi schemes eventually collapse, and maybe the repo crisis will do it, maybe not, but it is coming very soon. So, who do you think created this Ponzi and have been raping Americans since 1913? Let me know in the comment section below. This was the Atlantis Report. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.